All right, y'all, we are on video five of how to use Audacity, which is free open source software, to edit or to record and master and edit your audiobooks. This is editing part two, and in this video, we're going to talk specifically about how to use Filter Curve EQ to get rid of various sounds that we don't like in our recordings. And um, when I learned this, it was just revolutionary for me in learning how to get that recording to sound more and more clean and crisp and clear and um, not having all of those sounds that I don't like to be in there. So, um, uh, so, so let's get moving on it. We've got here our recording. We already started the editing on this. I just skipped over certain editing parts because I wanted to cover them on this recording. Now, um, Let's talk first about what Filter Curve does. And we talked some about what Filter Curve does when we set up our mastering, but let's say we were doing some Filter Curve on, actually, let's go to the first part that we wanted to change. We've got a little click here. I was born. And I don't know if you can hear it. I can hear it uh, when I'm sitting here right in front of my computer. I could really hear it if I had on headphones. Um, and so we, that's a click that I want to get rid of. Um, I will tell you, when I listen to professionally produced audiobooks, there are some voice clicks in there. I pick up on them in a way that I never did before I was recording my own audiobooks. So I've had to learn to be a little bit less perfectionistic when I'm editing my own books because otherwise it can take way, way, way too long. It's okay to have some slight clicks in your voice, but um, you don't want lots of them and you don't want them to be loud. You don't want a voice that sounds like it's just saliva pop after saliva pop after saliva pop. So some of that comes down to learning this editing technique to get rid of the pops and clicks that end up in there. Some of it comes down to training your voice. My voice is not in the greatest shape today as I'm recording, but I will tell you that I've learned some tricks to record cleaner. I just finished recording my fifth book, and they're all pretty long books, so I've got a lot of hours of recording under my belt now. Um, not nearly as many as a lot of professionals do, but you know, it's quite a bit for me. And I, I talk a lot cleaner than I used to, and really so much of that has just come through experience. I've learned to hear and feel in my voice when I've got popping and clicking going on. I know that I can immediately re-record it instead of trying to get rid of getting trying to get rid of it in editing. I'm really surprised going back to this chapter. This is not the book I just finished. This is chapter one of the previous book. I got a lot of pops and clicks in here, more than I would have on most of the chapters that I've recently recorded because I've learned to do fewer of those. Some other tips, I personally like to have a hot drink. Some people say don't have a hot drink, just have lukewarm. I like a hot drink. I, I feel like it helps. I have allergies and there's something about Kind of even I do a lot of gargling as I'm you know when I'm when my voice is getting poppy and clicky I'll gargle with that hot, I used to do hot water somebody recently suggested to me um, pineapple juice and she didn't say to do it hot but I actually have liked doing that I I mix some pineapple juice with some water so that's not quite so sweet and I heat it up and I put it in an insulated uh, an insulated tumbler and I've got that with me and I can. I can drink it and I can um, um, I can gargle with it. Um, sometimes even I've got this, again, I think this is allergy related, but I've got this little place in the back of my throat that, that clicks consistently. Sometimes if I just rub my tongue against that part of my throat, it helps. Sometimes if I make horrible hacking noises, it just <laughs> helps to like clear up whatever it is that's popping there. Um, taking my allergy medicine consistently is really important to me. And I usually keep a cut up apple with me where I can eat a little bit of apple. I, I like Granny Smith. That's the, um, the kind of classic advice is have a Granny Smith apple with you. There's something about that tartness and I think that that's why the pineapple juice works well too. But um, um, if I don't have Granny Smith, I just use something else. And if I don't have an apple, I might use carrots or something. Basically, I want something that I can eat to... Um, uh, eating seems to help as long as it's a food that doesn't leave behind a residue. And so things like apples are great for that. Um, so I take bites of apples when I need to. I, uh, I like to put aquaphor on my lips before I start because it's a nice, um, 
it's a nice like emollient that keeps my lips from popping themselves, you know, from like uh, making those lip noises. And then sometimes I reapply that if I need to. Um, and then I usually keep some Kleenex with me in case I need to blow my nose while I'm going. I just kind of have all my little tools that I keep with me. But um, that a hot drink has been important to me. Some days my voice is just more poppy and clicky than others too. And no matter what I do, it just ends up being a long recording session with lots of re-recorded portions. And, um, and sometimes that chapter ends up taking longer to edit too because I just couldn't get rid of all my clicks as I, as I recorded. So it's all a learning process. Um, when I first started, the, the average chapter would take me well over 10 minutes total. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the average like minute, each minute of final recording would probably take me probably an average of more like 11 or 12 minutes maybe. I don't know if it was quite that long, but um, between recording and editing and mastering. And now I'm down to a little over eight and a half minutes, maybe about 8.7 minutes, which is actually a pretty big difference once you look at the length of time that the whole book takes. Um, it's quite a few hours of difference of working on these books. If I've reduced my reduced my time by maybe, um, you know, by maybe 15 or 20 percent over the course of four books. And I'm hoping to reduce it even f farther. And some of that comes down to time of year that I'm recording in terms of allergies and stuff, too. But um, um, as you learn to record cleaner, it becomes better. And then as you learn to edit faster, it becomes better. And as I've learned to be a little less of a perfectionist on my editing, that's helped too. All right, so um, voice pops and clicks, that's one of the big things we deal with. Um, if it's at the beginning or end of a word, as I showed you, you can um, usually use the fade in or fade out effect to get rid of that pop or click, usually, not always, but usually. If it's in between words, you just use punch paste, but it's these clicks in the middle of words that can be tougher to get rid of, and that's what we're gonna use our filter curve for. I also use filter curve to get rid of popping sounds. My current mic is nice and warm, but it it tends to pick up higher or lower frequencies. And so sometimes I end up with popping peas and other sounds that just it's like this jarring pop sound. So I use filter curve EQ for that. We'll go over that in a minute. And we also can use filter curve for things like S's that are extra hissy or SH sounds that are extra hissy. We can use it for things like that as well. So we'll talk about that too. All right, let's talk about pops and clicks too, since these are my Achilles heel. Here's the important thing to learn about filter curve. Let's bring up our filter curve command. Command two is what I have mine set up as. Again, that would be under um, effects if you wanna do it that way. Now, let's look at this click. I know the click is the vertical line. I told you clicks show up as vertical lines, uh, usually. Sometimes it's it's smaller, it's more of a little dot than a line, but um, it's usually a line. And so when I look at this, it starts at a little under 7K, maybe 6.5K on my frequency, okay? Over here on the left-hand side, this is one of the reasons that we are using spectrogram view. And this one goes almost to the top. In fact, I can even see it maybe a little at the top. It just keeps going up to the top of my frequencies. That's the portion in our filter curve that we want to reduce. Let's flatten this filter curve, flatten. So remember what filter curve does is it allows us to boost or reduce certain frequencies. Well, when I can look at my spectrogram and see that a click is between six and a half thousand uh, hertz and goes all the way up, I know that's the portion I need to reduce on my filter curve. Remember this bottom scale on the filter curve is related to the up and down scale on your recording. So let's go over to six and a half thousand. We've got 5,000 here, we've got six here, we've got six and a half. I'm gonna click and put a little dot there. You can see that little dot. And then I usually come down by about maybe 12 decibels. I'm gonna, so I had to click again, pull it down. Remember you want a little angle on there. 
and I know that I'm going to be reducing everything above six and a half thousand, which is where my click is. Now, I don't want to reduce it too much. I don't want to bring it all the way down because then you can end up with something that just sounds really weird. So 12 is often what I go to. And then I would actually save this because if I have one click that sounds like that, I'm going to have another click that sounds like it. I have over time come up with all of these weird names for all of these click reducers. <laughs> I've got midword double less, midword higher less. It, it, trust me, it all makes sense to me. That's all that matters. You're going to save yours as something that makes sense to you. So you might save this preset as 6.5 plus. I don't know what it's what's going to sound good to you. You um, um, in my case, I like it was this one would probably be like midword high and that less because eventually originally I had had these um, reduced a lot more and then I went and changed them where it, it, anyways it, it all makes sense to me do whatever makes sense to you save your presets so that you can so you don't have to manually do this every time okay so um, we'll just call this one 6.5 plus and we're gonna say okay All right, you can see that that little click is a lot lighter. That's actually probably enough. Um, if it was a really loud click, it would be really dark, and we might have to rerun this, this filter curve twice to get rid of it, but we're not necessarily looking down to get it, looking to get it to where it's nothing. We don't have to completely reduce it. We just want it to kind of like blend in with the surrounding sounds. Now here's the problem. I got rid of the click, but I've got these two new clicks that I have introduced by changing everything all around the click. And that's why, even if you don't like using a noise gate, you need this second muted track beneath because we can take the sounds around the click. Now, if you try to just adjust the, if you try to only adjust the click, it's gonna be really hard to get it to sound right. You're still gonna possibly end up with these weird bars of sound on either side of where you adjusted it. So we're gonna, take the good sound in our muted track all around the click. I'm going to start right next to the click, highlight, copy it, command C, shift up arrow to highlight the exact same amount on the, on the top track, command V for paste. Look at that. We got rid of that big ugly sound there. We're going to start here on the right hand side of it of the click, highlight, command C, shift up arrow, command V. Look, so on the bottom we've got this clicky thing. On the top you can hardly even see the click anymore. Let's see how it sounds. I was born. That sounds great. I don't know if you could hear the click before again because you know you're probably listening through a computer and I could hear it in my headphones and now I can't anymore. Or I, I could actually hear it without my headphones. I would have really been able to hear it with my headphones and now I can't hear that click, which is awesome. I was born. Now that copy paste thing we just did, that's why we have to keep these two tracks lined up 100% perfectly. Because if we try to copy and paste and they're not lined up, it will not sound right. Um, you're going to end up with like extra lines here and it's just going to sound choppy and bad. And so um, again, if you ever accidentally delete something or add something to the top track and you don't do it on the, the medium track, you might have to like take the entire rest of the medium track. You would highlight the entire thing all the way to the end of the track and then you would copy it. You would paste it up into the top track and you would, um, you would noise gate just that portion that you pasted up into the top track. Um, you would only noise gate the top track, not the middle track, to, to have it line up perfectly again, if that's the mistake that you made. All right, um, another thing, by the way, that I forgot to point out um, was sometimes Fs or, or Ths will get buzzy where they sound like, um, like you're, it vibrates too much. I do have specific filter curve stuff for that too. If we come across one, I'll show you, or um, I may just um, kind of show you even if, even if it's not a, a bad spot. So here we go. The First Generation, a memoir by Leary Aubrey. Now that M on memoir, sometimes an M in the middle um, of a, a word will show up as a, 
kind of a click. It doesn't sound bad to me on this word. If it sounded bad to me, because sometimes it does, we could get rid of that one too, but let's keep going. A memoir by Leary Abria. Little click here. I'm going to ignore that one. It doesn't look or sound bad because there's enough loud noises around it to make it not sound bad. Abrios. Darling, your crown is crooked. Okay, we heard that click before. Now we got to figure out where was that click? Good. Is it this line? Is it this line? Is it this line? Well, I can tell you this line is the D. Remember D's and B's and, and certain sounds like that can look like clicks because our voice is actually making that harsh sound. So it's not this line. We don't want to get rid of, of that line that's right there. I can tell you this one looks like it's kind of blending into the surrounding stuff. I'm pretty sure it's this line right here. So I'm going to highlight a little bit of a larger portion and let's scroll over so that it's close to our scale here on the left. Let's open up our filter curve. Now, this one, we could go all the way to the top again like we did before because there's not much happening up here. But it started lower. It started at like 3.5K. So let's drag this because we still got our previous one up. 3.5. Again, you'd want to save it. Save preset. I might call it 3.5 plus. I wish I had like made these presets with better names when I did it. <laughs> I would have done number-based names like I'm showing you. And then let's see how that goes. It's definitely lighter, but it's still kind of dark. I'm going to actually repeat that one, Command R. There we go. That's better. Let's paste in the good stuff on either side of it. Going to copy it, Command C, Shift, up arrow, Command V. And then on the other side too. Sometimes we might, we actually might not even need to paste it in here. Um, this looks pretty good. Let's see how it sounds. Oh, it's crooked. Yeah, that sounds good. Nora turned to her fault. Okay, let's see where else we might need to fix stuff. By the way, sometimes you'll see something like this, and if you can hear it, that one's really mild, so you probably can't really hear it, but if you could, we've got enough of a break between these two sounds. We could just use fade out with this one, probably. We'd highlight it, and then we'd do our little fade out, just FYI. All right, let's see where else we might. Hang on, let me hear. Me, it's not a crown. It's a okay. That I can just tell you in my headphones might be a harsh C sound on crown. Um, it's the sa it's a the same effect as a pop sound on a poppy P. Um, those harsh k sounds can be can sound really harsh sometimes with my particular mic. So I have set up. Let me show you what I have set up already as what we call the pop killer. <laughs> this is probably my most commonly used filter curve on for the mic that I have right now. Um, pop killer starts at 300 hertz, and I take it down from there, um, kind of a um, an angled line. That's my pop killer. You're welcome to copy it and save it as your own pop killer. And you can see it takes out the very bottom and that usually takes care of my pops, my poppy, bassy pops that I have um, sometimes that my mic picks up despite double pop filters. My voice can be really poppy. All right. Not a crown, it's a headdress. When it's just the two of us, it's a crown. His brown eyes twinkled as he pointed to the band of gold around his head. One day, you'll wear the real thing. Okay. We had a little bit of a, um, that TH sounded a little funky thing. Uh, if you wanted to, you could see, you can actually see why it sounded funky. You can see there's a darker spot right there. With a TH, lots of times you can actually just highlight that little dark spot. Shift down arrow and delete it. Because if your TH is long enough, you're not going to be able to tell that part of it's missing. The real thing. And there's still a little line here that's kind of making it sound funky. I'm getting really picky here. I probably wouldn't actually fix this because sometimes those THs and, and Vs will sound weird. This is not the buzzy V or TH or, or um, F or TH that I was telling you about, about before, not V, but F. This is just different. This is just where it sounds a little poppy on your, or a little clicky, a little clicky on your TH. Highlight down arrow and delete. The real thing. Yeah, that sounds fine. Nora was only 17. She wasn't ready to think about the day when she'd become... 
Okay, I've got a few, a couple little clicks here. Um, I'm going to show you this one. This one is not bad, but this is an L click. And I have a lot of these L clicks where um, an L in the middle of a word just ends up popping. And they look in a very, they look like something really particular. You can see, again, lots of times they're worse than this one. I might just leave this one alone. But if I was fixing one, you can see there's a little bit of a pop right here at the bottom. Not quite at the bottom. And there's a pop, like a click up top too, but not in between. This is like a double little one and that that's very characteristic of what my L pops sound like. So if it's one that needs to be fixed, again this one might not need to be, I would highlight it, go into my filter curve, and I have saved something called mid-word double. Um, and that's lined up with about where this one starts, which is um, pretty low. I've got it starting below 1000. This particular one might not actually start quite that low, but this doesn't always have to be exact. Goes up to about three and a half thousand, right? And then it starts again about 5000 and goes up to 10,000. This one actually might go all the way up. So if I wanted to, I could pull this part down, but let's just try it this way. And then again, looks terrible. I would have to copy and paste from the previous, I mean, from the, the middle muted track. Paste that in. Sometimes when you paste it in, it doesn't paste in very, um, very neatly. You still have a line there. So I might do Command Z to undo that and just try a little bit of a different spot and see if it works that way. Command C, Shift up arrow, Command V. And I've still got a little line. Let's just see how it sounds. Girl was only 17. That sounds good. She wasn't ready to think about um, Depending how it sounds in my headphones, I might get rid of that pop. I'm not really hearing it now. I might get rid of this one. Um, I'm not really hearing that now. But um, in fact, yeah, that was, that's probably one that I would hear if, with my headphones. So starts at 7,000, goes to 10,000, a little over 10,000, maybe closer to 11. So command two, flatten. I would start at 7K, go down, a little above 10, go up, and then I would again save that and um, might save it as 7 to 11. I don't know. And then I would do my little fix here. Again, these are not always ones that I might fix in real life. I just want to show you examples of how to do it. Command C, Shift up arrow, Command V. The day when she'd become an orphan and a queen all at once. Okay, that S sounded a little bit hissy. Honestly, not very hissy, but I haven't heard any really hissy ones in this sample that I'm showing you. So let me show you how I would take care of a hissy S if it was hissy enough to take care of. I'm going to highlight it here. And I could see, in fact, let me unhighlight it. You can see where the darker parts are on the S. It's even getting a little bit white here. Remember I told you white is the loudest? You can see where the hiss is by seeing where it gets darker. Those are going to be the noises that tend to stick out more is the darker noises and the ones that sometimes even get to white um, or almost white where it gets really loud. You can see the kind of loudness over here where it gets almost white. All right, so um, that is at about like seven and a half to nine K. Now, let me show you what I've got set up for my hissy S. Shrill S is what I have mine called. Um, I've actually got it set up a little bit higher because whenever I was setting it up, the one that I was dealing with was shrill in kind of a higher area. So for this one, I might I might change it to seven and a half let's see there's five thousand six thousand seven oh that is about seven and a half where i had it set it just doesn't need to go quite as high as i had it before set it to about 10. i would i would name that hissy s or whatever i wanted to name it would say okay and you'll notice on that one let me go back to it i didn't go down as far i only went down to negative nine because um it's easy to overdo it on S's and, and it ends up sounding muddy, so I don't go down as far on those. Let's see how it sounds. Once. 
sounds fine. To that me. won't happen for a long time. Straighten that. Okay, and I want to show you one more thing. Won't happen for a long time. Here's an F. Let's pretend that this F was one of those buzzy Fs. Uh, it's not. I don't. I don't have a buzzy F to show you right now. But if it were, you would actually see. You would kind of see the buzz. It would look almost like a zigzaggy here at the very bottom of the F. And because of we would see where that sort of zigzaggy buzz was, we would be able to set up. I have two F or TH. Um, one of them is called less drastic. One of them is more. Sometimes it's a really, really buzzy F or TH. But um, I usually start with the less drastic unless I know it's a bad one. And just so you know, that's that's where I've got mine set up. You're welcome to copy that if you want to, or just see what yours look like. How far up does that buzz go? And I take it down, and um, and that would fix that, so it wouldn't be buzzy anymore if it were buzzy. Um, usually with Fs and Ths and Ss, you're usually able to just adjust that part, and you don't usually have to copy and paste from the middle track because um, just the nature of what those Fs and THs look like if you, and also the pops, like the poppy Ps or the poppy Ks, lots of times you're able to just adjust those without pulling up and copying and pasting like you have to with the clicks. Been for a long time. Straighten the headdress for me. He grasped it with both hands, shifting it to the left. It scratched Nora's forehead, eliciting a wince. Sorry, does it feel secure? Okay, one more example. That is a nice little pop. Let's see, it starts at about 7K. Let's see what ours, we had one, a preset that started at 6.5K and, and went all the way up. That one's actually gonna work for this. So we select our preset. That's a nice thing. You're gonna get presets and they're gonna work for your voice. You're not gonna keep having to make presets all the time. You're gonna get your catalog of presets and they will work for your voice because you're gonna to tend to have the same pops and clicks over and over in your voice. Sometimes you'll have to adjust it a little bit, but uh, the preset a little bit, but usually you're gonna be able to use those same presets over and over. That got rid of most of it. I'm actually gonna repeat that one. Now the cool thing is this was so close to the end of a word that it, it just, it, it, we don't have any funky lines. In fact, we don't even have any funky lines before it. It might sound fine without doing any copying and pasting of the, the track beneath it. Does it feel secure? Uh, it sounds a little weird to me, like like his R sounds a little weird, so I am going to copy and paste before it. Copy, shift up arrow, paste. Does it feel secure? As secure as it gets. The headdress was crafted of fine silver. With All right, so hopefully that gives you an idea of how to deal with pops and clicks and things in the middle of words and Hissy S's, um, this is totally a hissy S here. I can see it. Um, it may not sound bad, but I can see it. And so if it did sound bad in my, in my um, headphones, I'm only highlighting the part portion that's just the S. See how down here the previous sound kind of comes into the S? I'm only highlighting just the S. Well, I want to make sure I get that whole hissy part. You can see the dark hissy part, or kind of the light colored. And then I would go to my shrill s preset and see how it sounds fine silver and sometimes these lines are okay if you can't hear them in your headphones leave them there it's fine fine silver with delicate filigree extending high above nora's head all right whatever weird sounds it is that your voice deals with here's one that might sound weird if i was on a, a headphone most of them you can you can get rid of through filter curve. Every once in a while you're gonna try one and you just can't get it to sound right using the filter curve and you just have to leave it there or you have to re-record it. But usually you can take care of those. Um, it goes pretty fast once you get used to it. If you're using keyboard shortcuts, it really goes faster. But um, you know what's even faster is not having those sounds there in the first place. So keep working on cleaner recording and then you'll have to do less and less editing as you go. And remember, listeners won't hear every little sound, so you don't have to be a complete perfectionist. But if you have a really poppy voice with lots of saliva pops and things like that, then you will need to get rid of a lot of them um, or risk turning off some readers who are sensitive to those sounds. Now, let's say that we have finished our entire chapter of editing. 
um, let's say it's a 10 minute chapter, uh, this initial editing pass for me in, with a 10 minute chapter would probably take about 50 to 60 minutes, sometimes a little less, every once in a while more. Um, and so that 10 minute chapter, I would then go back to the beginning of the chapter and listen to the entire thing again, uh, usually playing a game on my phone or doing other things. Sometimes, sometimes I'm way too distracted when I'm doing my listen through, but um, doing something to keep me busy, um, but trying to listen for anything I might have missed. And then we got a couple more steps to finish this up. We're making sure that we're saving frequently while editing. I do lots of saving while editing and while recording. We're gonna go at the very end. Now, I, as you saw, like to cut out lots of little empty spaces where um, I've got too much, too much noise. I mean, too much just lack of noise in between uh, paragraphs and such. That means that this room noise track is too long. So I'm gonna go back after I've done my listen through, my second listen through, I'm going to copy. Now, I can actually, con I can actually click the shift button to continue my copying. I'm gonna copy it to the very end here. It gives me this nice little thing here. Oh, by the way, at the end of a chapter, I would make sure I had exactly, or just over three seconds of room tone. This is only a partial chapter, so I don't even have, um, I don't have extra space here, but normally I would, when I'm recording, I would record several seconds at the end. I would trim it so there's three seconds at the end of a chapter, or just over three seconds, so that, it, so that I don't accidentally go under. So. Um, three to five seconds. I think you can actually do like one second, but I usually do three seconds, just over three seconds. Um, you'll have to look at ACX requirements to see what their requirement is. I don't remember what it is. All right, so I'm deleting this extra room tone. I do one more step before I save and export to WAVE. This step is really optional. Um, I do it because I am anal retentive, but it's optional. I'm going back to the beginning here and show you what I do. If you notice, We've got an entire track of room tone, but you know what? When you talk, there's room tone underneath it. There's room tone under everything. And the noise gate didn't get rid of the room tone while you were talking. It only got rid of the room tone in between your talking. That's the only silence. So if we use this track of room tone and we put it underneath the entire thing, we've actually got like double room tone under our talking. Now, is anybody gonna notice that? Maybe not. Probably not, but I like to get rid of it because I only want my track of room tone to fill in what the noise gate took out. I don't want it to give double room tone under where I'm talking because I'm anal. And so I'm gonna move this track up to the top. This room tone track, we click right where it says audio track, we click move, to, move track to top. And it has to be at the top to do what we're about to do. We've still got our muted track here, our unmuted track here. You select this room tone track, and we're going to do what's called auto duck. I've got mine set up as command six auto duck. I believe these are the defaults, um, but you can check the document and make sure, um, you know, ch check my how to document, make sure that, um, that the numbers are right. Auto duck is going to take out any portion of room tone that's going over a part that's already uh, where you were already talking. While that's working, let me explain to you what Autodeck is sometimes used for. By the way, the estimated time on Autodeck is never right. It always takes way longer than it says. Uh, so for a long chapter, it takes a few minutes. Um, okay, let's say that you're doing a video and you've got, um, or a podcast, and you've got background music, and you want the background music going the whole time, but you want the background music to go now, to, to automatically get quieter when you're talking and be louder when you're not talking. That's what Autodeck is used for. It doesn't have to be used to take a sound completely out. It can just be used to reduce a sound so that like music gets quieter when you're talking and louder when you're not. But we use it for this. I found that tip somewhere and it works really well. So you can see our room tone here is going where we've got no noise right here. But where I'm talking, where there's already room tone underneath it, the room tone's gone. Autodeck has taken it out for me. Pretty cool. I just think it's kind of nifty. Again, totally optional. I'm going to save this. Command S. And then I'm going to export it to WAVE. 
um, which would be File, Export, Export to Wave. It's also, if you prefer, Command-Shift-W. I would say Sample Edit Wave. I would just keep the same. Okay. Now here's where we've got something called metadata, which I like to have my metadata where it needs to be. It doesn't really matter with ACX, but like if I wanted to listen to my whole book on iTunes, if I wanted to import it or give it to somebody else to listen to on iTunes, metadata keeps everything in order because you can have track numbers and such. So, um, so I go ahead and what I do is I set up my metadata for the entire book. So um, the book I just finished recording was called The Vine Eater. I set up my artist name, my album title, the year, and then I click set default. And that way this is gonna always come up every time I export. When I start another book, I will set the default again with the new book title and the new year. And, um, and then for every time that I'm exporting a WAV file or later on an MP3 file, I just... Um, I just put in the track title. And by the way, there is a way to export a whole bunch of MP3 files all at once. It's awesome. Um, I have that in my document. I'm not going to show you guys, but I put everything in Wave, and then I have a particular way of exporting all those MP3 files all at once. All right, so this would be track title one zero one for chapter one, and the track number would be two because. Um, you always have an intro track where you're like saying the frost eater by Carol Beth Anderson. Um, it, it, there's this particular opening credits that you have to do for ACX so that your opening credits are always track one. And, um, and I would click okay. And it would export to wave, which takes a few seconds sometimes. And then we're good. And we can save it one more time, close it, and we've got a chapter that's finished and we can move on to our next one. Um, let's talk about a couple of other things. If you need to re-record, uh, you will come across stuff. I mean, you're doing a big book. You will come across stuff that you can't edit properly. You said something wrong, you said the wrong word, or you, something just sounds really bad. You didn't realize you had a really big stomach growl that ended up in there, things like that. So to re-record, here's what I do. I usually pull up another chapter that I've already recorded but haven't edited yet. Because um, I'm usually recording several chapters and then going in. I'm, I'm usually a few chapters ahead on my recording compared to my editing. So I pull up another chapter. If you don't have another chapter that you haven't edited yet, just pull up an old raw chapter, not edited, but raw, and record at the end of that chapter. So I pull up this chapter that I haven't, um, that I haven't edited yet. I record whatever I need to re-record. So, um, in fact, let me show you something. I forgot to show you this. Um, as I'm editing, I usually don't immediately re-record because I might have to re-record multiple things for that chapter. So if I come across something, I wait till I've finished editing the chapter to re-record. So let's do, um, um, this is not coming up. Here we go. Sample edit. Let's say that at the very beginning, I found something that needed to be re-recorded. Two years after the war. And it was, it was this thing two years after. Let's say it was supposed to be three years after, okay? There's something you can do called labeling, and it's command B as in boy. And then you type in here two years, or you might type in three years, whatever, whatever you want to type in. It's just so you can find it later in the middle of a, in the middle of a track. It's really, really helpful. Uh, you can even zoom way out in your track to see, oh, that's the entire track. It's my entire five minute track and I can see all the labels that I had down here. And so I would go back over here to two years. Um, I would zoom in, zoom back in. I would click on it go up to this track and I would listen, okay, what does this sound like? Two years after the world ended. Because sometimes my voice is tired, sometimes my voice is louder, it's softer, it's quieter. Um, I want whatever I'm re-recording to sound as similar to what my voice sounded like while I was recording as possible. So right before I record the next thing, I listen 
two years after the world ended. Okay, and then I would go to the end of a previous raw, unedited track, just go to the very end of it, and then I would re-record it, and I would re-record it a few times. So I might do it a little bit louder, might do it a little bit softer, I might do it a little bit um, um, higher pitched and lower pitched, so that I can have a few options. And then what I do is I go ahead and master that entire new chapter, the one where I put the edited part at the end. So um, if I'm working on chapter one, I might go to my recording of chapter two, my raw recording. I record whatever I needed to re-record for chapter one at the end of chapter two. And then I master all of chapter two, including that part that I re-recorded. The thing is, you don't want to re-record in a brand new file because the mastering can kind of be messed up if you don't have a long enough file to deal with. So just do it at the end of a, an existing file. You get a head start on that next file because you're mastering it. And then you've got a mastered portion that you can take and copy and paste whatever the best part is to copy and paste. Uh, whichever option, you know, if you've done it four times, you choose the one that sounds the most similar to the surrounding sound. Two years and you after paste the it in. And, um, and you want to look at the best place to paste. Um, paste. Sometimes you can't just re-record one word because words flow into each other and sometimes there won't be a good place to paste it. But right here where it says two years after, two years af, <laughs> two years af, I could actually, if it was supposed to be three years after, I could just do three years af and just paste in that part. And then um, I'm just I'm just, re, you know, I would probably re-record the entire phrase, but basically I'm pasting in. And the reason I can paste it right there is because there's actually a little break between the F and the T in after. There's a break there, so that's a great place to paste. Um, so you can repaste a whole phrase or you can repaste portions of words as long as you're repasting at the right place. You'd never want to repaste right here because there's not a break there. It's going to sound weird, but you can repaste where there's a natural break in the sound. And, um, and usually get it to sound pretty good. So that's how we redo stuff. Um, there's also one other thing I wanna show you. Once you have recorded the whole chapter, there's a couple of ways you can check and make sure that this thing actually fits ACX requirements. So um, because we've got multiple tracks here, I don't wanna use ACX check on my Audacity file. Instead, let's open up the wave file that we just made. Now, by the way, I don't usually check on ACX until I'm done with the whole book. You might want to check one chapter at a time, especially when you start to make sure that you've that your mastering is working the way that it's supposed to. So you're not messing up anything while you're editing. I know that mine works well, so I don't usually check it till the end. But let's say I wanted to check it. I would pull up this wave file because a wave file, while it 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 saves all of your information, it's only in one track. And so um, we've got a WAV file. I could change it to spectrogram if I want to. I don't have to. I can zoom it if I want to. I, don't, I really don't have to. I can just select the whole thing, Command K for ACX check, and it passed. And it's not even giving me my funky, hey, this is too quiet thing, because the room noise that I pasted in was loud enough to give me a nice check. The other way for you to check is you can actually check all of your wave files all at once for an entire book, which is awesome. It's so awesome. Uh, I, I just, when I found this tool, I was so excited. It saved me so much time. So um, here we go. Easy way to check for ACX compliance in this document. It's called Second Opinion Tool. It's on Stephen J. Cohen's website. It's totally free but you can give him like a tip or somewhere here where, um, yeah, you can give him like a $5 tip if you want to. So, um, or a $25 tip or whatever, just to thank him for this file because it's completely free, which is super awesome. And it's very, very helpful. So this gives installation instructions. I'll let you read all of this on your own. It gives really good instructions. What you will need is to have a folder on your uh, on your computer that's just your wave files it's not your audacity files it's just your wave files so once i've recorded the whole book i copy all of those wave files into their own folder 
and um, and I run the second opinion tool. Um, I've got it here in my applications um, second opinion. I run that and um, again his website does a great job giving you instructions on how to do that and it, it takes a while to do an entire book but it gives me this report. Sometimes I've accidentally not put enough room noise at the beginning of a chapter or I've put too much. I forgot to trim it down. Um, sometimes in my editing I ended up going too loud on a chapter and it's louder than negative three decibels. This file, I mean this this tool will tell you all of that so you can fix that stuff before you upload to ACX. Um, when you upload to ACX, what I do is, um, I'm not going to pull up the, the, the place to upload right now because it would take me too long, but um, uh, you've got, um, you're going to upload, you've got this big page on ACX where you upload all of your, your files individually. So you, you select a file and you give it a name like chapter one and you, um, and then you can select the next file and you can have multiple files uploading at once. And then what I do is on the ACX website, I listen to the very beginning of my chapter and make sure that it says chapter one when I think it's chapter one. I listen to the very end and make sure it sounds like the end of my chapter. Listen to the very beginning and the very end of every single one on the ACX upload page to make sure that I've got all the, the files correct, that nothing got um, cut short, anything like that to make sure that I've got all the sound correct before I upload to um, to uh, to ACX. By the way, you don't upload WAV files, you upload MP3 files. So once you've got all your WAV files and you've passed them all with second opinion, I personally like to set up a macro for, um, for exporting all of my WAV files into MP3 files all at once. It takes quite a while, but you can see how to do it on this Google Doc. I'm not going to go over it with you, but it's just this nice macro so you're not individually exporting each WAV file to MP3. All right, hope that makes sense. Um, again, you're always welcome to leave a comment with questions or contact me through my website, which is carolbethanderson.com. At the end of my uh, mastering and editing document, you've got quick and dirty just so that you can see, you can be reminded of what the process is for each of these. And um, uh, and that once you get, you know, you've got all the details earlier in this document, but once you get used to it, that quick and dirty can help you stay on track. I think that's it, guys. Let me know if you have any questions. And thank you for watching this video tutorial series.